Hi, my name is Teresa Bolger and I'm a consultant archaeologist working with Rubicon Heritage Services. This is the fifth in a series of talks about archaeology in the context of construction projects and development control. Our previous talks outlined, firstly, what archaeology is, why it's important and the legal framework for its protection, then how archaeology fits into the planning process, followed by an overview of archaeological methods and practice and most recently, an overview of how to manage archaeology as a risk item within the lifetime of a construction project. This talk will focus on construction contracts, how archaeological services are included within construction contracts. As you will see in this talk, it ties in very closely to the management of archaeology as a project risk. Approaches to contracting for archaeological services can strongly affect the management of project risk. There are three broad models for the contracting of archaeological services in relation to construction projects. Firstly, a standalone or independent contracts, where archaeological works are commissioned and are carried out wholly separate to any construction works. The services are provided under a direct contract to the client or developer. The construction contractor has little to no involvement. As parallel contracts, the archaeologist or archaeological consultancy is again directly contracted to the client or developer, but there may be an overlap with the construction contract. Archaeological services that must occur at various points must be facilitated by the construction contractor within their overall programme of works under the terms of their contract. Any archaeological risks remain with the client or developer, but the contractor does retain risk in relation to the coordination and facilitation of necessary archaeological works within their programme. Thirdly, as subcontracts. Archaeological services are requested as a specific service within a broader construction contract. The construction contractor must appoint a suitable subcontractor to the role. The construction contractor is responsible for the delivery of archaeological services as set out in the contract and takes on any archaeological risks specified in the contract. It is important when approaching these contracts at tender stage to ensure that any required archaeological services are sufficiently scoped by the client or the developer and properly understood by the prospective contractor. The first and third scenarios aren't the most common. It is important when looking at the management of archaeological risk during construction stage to assess which broad contractual model applies, as this will affect how and to whom the responsibility for the risk transfers. To this, we need to add the two distinct tendering and contracting environments, public sector versus private sector. The public sector contracting environment is heavily prescribed. All contracts, whether wholly for archaeological services or incorporating archaeological services in part, must adhere to current Department of Finance rules. Standardised template schedules and agreements for archaeological services are required to be used. Tendering is subject to EU procurement rules, so only small scale works of limited expected value can be commissioned via closed or invitation only tenders. In all other cases, there must be an open or public tendering procedure. There is an aim to achieve a fixed price in as much as possible, with only limited remeasure, if at all. Recent changes to the Department of Finance guidelines have also brought in requirements for quality that can substantially affect tender award. Public sector contracts tend to transfer project risks, including archaeological risks, as much as possible to the appointed contractor. The National Roads Authority, now incorporated into Transport Infrastructure Ireland, pioneered the development of a contract structure and framework for archaeological services. This will be discussed in more detail later in the talk, as their contract model and standards have been rolled out across almost all publicly funded entities. Private sector contracts encompass all works commissioned by non-publicly funded entities. The contract structures can be quite broad, there is no prescribed model, Though models developed by the RIAI or SIF for general contracting or subcontracting purposes may be adapted. The only general requirement would be compliance with current contract law. Tendering for archaeological services, if it occurs, is generally on a closed or invitation only basis. It is not uncommon for an archaeological consultant to be appointed at design stage and for them to be retained on rolling contracts as the scope of required archaeological works emerges and is defined during the course of the project. 
Equally, there may be a break with different providers appointed at different stages of the work, either directly by the developer or a subcontractor, still planning consultants, architect or construction contractor. It is down to the main client or developer to decide how they want to approach this. Archaeological services can be provided on a fixed price or a remeasurable basis or a combination of the two. This may be specified at the outset by the commissioning client or may emerge through negotiation between the various parties to a particular contract. This is where appropriate professionals, either directly employed or contracted, act on behalf of a developer to design and supervise a construction contract. In Ireland, this occurs within public sector contracts only, but in other jurisdictions, notably the United Kingdom, it can be a factor in both public and private sector contracts. For a broad range of construction services contracts, where archaeological services, if needed, are only one of a broad suite of services required, an employer's representative or resident engineer may act on behalf of the client to supervise the contract and ensure that the works and services are carried out as per the agreed contract requirements. While in day-to-day -day practice this will usually be a single nominated person, they will often act with the support of a range of qualified professionals whose expertise reflects the deliverables required under the contract. Commonly, where a design team was appointed to design the development and develop the tender specification, they will be retained to act in this capacity and oversee the delivery of the construction contract. Where an archaeologist is included within this team, they are usually referred to in practice and in the contract documents as the project archaeologist. The established codes of practice between the Minister for Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht and a range of state agencies and semi-state bodies, amongst other things, require that these organisations appoint project archaeologists to provide professional advice, expertise and oversight. The codes clearly set out the role of the project archaeologist, including in relation to the preparation of tenders and supervision of contracts. All standalone contracts for archaeological services commissioned by the bodies with codes of practice are supervised by a project archaeologist. In some cases, the project archaeologist effectively carries out the role of the employer's representative in full, but generally only for contracts wholly for archaeological services. Broader construction contracts issued by these bodies that also include provision for archaeological services as an element must provide for contract supervision by a project archaeologist, in this case as a designated special advisor to the employer's representative. Not all public bodies and organisations have agreed codes of practice. County councils are a good example of this. However, many of these bodies will still appoint an employer's representative or equivalent to supervise contracts either wholly comprising archaeological services or which have archaeological services as a component. Unfortunately, many do not appoint a project archaeologist in any capacity. This leaves the supervision of the delivery of archaeological services to non-expert personnel without any source of qualified advice. This absence of expertise can lead to a transfer of contract risk back to the client. As I already mentioned, when the fixed price regimen was first introduced, the National Roads Authority, now amalgamated into Transport Infrastructure Ireland, developed a four-stage contracting structure and framework for archaeological services. This framework has continued to evolve and be refined by TII in the intervening years. This contract structure or framework was very early on adopted for use generally in public service contracting for archaeological services. However, while it is a very effective model, it must be remembered that it was developed and designed to meet the specific needs of the roads construction program. As a result, while it is treated like a Swiss army knife to serve the needs of a diverse range of public sector bodies and projects, the lack of understanding of its origins and intended applications means that it is often adapted poorly or badly for non-ROADS projects. Also, TII retain project archaeologists on staff, so their contracts always have suitably qualified professional input and oversight. This is frequently absent in other organisations using the contract framework. The four stages cover prospection, the identification of any subsurface archaeological sites, through to resolution or sterilisation of those sites. The aim of these contracts is to ensure that all significant archaeological risks are fully resolved prior to construction as a separate contained phase of works. The successive phases are interdependent in terms of scope. 
They reflect a rolling wave approach to scope definition. The outputs and deliverables from each stage directly inform the scope of the next successive stage. Stage one is a prospection stage. The aim of this stage is to identify the location of any potential sites and provide an initial assessment of their character. The services at this stage are usually characterized by a comprehensive program of archeological test trenching, but may also include geophysical survey, ten land boundary surveys, built heritage surveys, wade or dive surveys, as and if required. The key deliverable, the stage one report, will describe the findings and define all identified archaeological sites or features that may be subject to impact from the scheme. Stage two is still a prospection stage. It is usually referred to as strip and map. Whereas in stage one, only linear test trenches were opened up, during stage two, larger areas are stripped of topsoil to expose the horizontal area of any archaeological sites in fall. Limited hand excavation of samples of some of the exposed features may occur in order to evaluate the character of each site and the general depth of archaeological stratigraphy. The results of stage one directly inform the scope of these works. These opening up works are carried out at each of the sites identified through stage one prospection. The deliverable from this stage is a clear mapped extent of the area of each archaeological site that will require archaeological excavation, as well as a preliminary assessment of its expected character and depth of stratigraphy. An environmental remains strategy is also required. Stage three is a resolution stage. This stage is characterized by all on-site works associated with the full archaeological excavation of all sites as defined by the stage two works. Environmental sampling is carried out in line with the environmental remains strategy, also defined at stage two. The deliverables from this stage include a preliminary excavation report for each site, a post-excavation assessment and environmental remains assessment for each site, and an updated environmental remains strategy for the project as a whole. Stage four is also a resolution stage. However, works have now moved off site. The key activity at this stage is the specialist analysis of the finds and samples retained during stage three. The scope for this is set out in the post excavation assessments and environmental remains strategy that were produced in stage three. We will talk in more detail about post excavation analysis and its importance in the final talk in the series. The deliverables from this stage are the full excavation report and the dissemination of the results. Dissemination activities can include posters, public talks or publications of various types. Contracts for archaeological services using this model commonly group multiple stages together into a single contract package. Project contracts can be structured as stage one to four contracts. However, this can be problematic and challenging, potentially exposing both client and contractor to avoidable project risk. As the ultimate scope for each stage is defined by the previous one in an iterative process, chaining all stages together in a single contract creates a risky structure with high levels of project uncertainty and risk. Often works are split into two contract packages, commonly stages one to two encompassing all the prospection works and stages three to four encompassing all resolution works. It can also occur that stage two is grouped with stages three and four, leaving stage one as a separate contract. For entities and organisations utilising and adapting the TII stage contract structure for their projects, it is important to note in particular the iterative scope definition between stages and the importance of a project archaeologist on the client side. These contracts were designed to operate with project archaeologist input and oversight. This is particularly critical at the stage transitions. Also, the stage contract model is intended for the delivery of archaeological services as a standalone enabling works phase in advance of the construction programme. Where archaeological services need to be integrated into a broader construction contract, this model does not really apply well. So in this talk, we have outlined some key issues for consideration when archaeological services need to be incorporated into construction contracts. Please check back again soon for more talks in this series. Our previous four talks, firstly outlining what archaeology is, why it's considered important and the legislation protecting it, 
Secondly, looking at archaeology in the planning process. Thirdly, giving an overview of archaeological methods and practice. And fourthly, an overview of how best to manage archaeology as a risk item in construction projects are available for you to watch. The final talk in this series will outline what is involved in post-excavation analysis and why it is a critical part of the archaeological process. If you want to find out more about structuring contracts to include for archaeological services, there is a list of links to further resources in our blog post for this talk.